Good morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of Christ, welcome as we come to worship God today. Welcome also to those of you who are watching us online this morning. Uh, we are glad that you were able to join us, uh, even if you join us later on today. Um, we know that it's not location necessarily that brings us together, but the Spirit of Christ. And so welcome, uh, welcome to our family of God as we come together to worship today. I do want to call your attention to the announcements in our bulletin. We do have some things going on in the life of the church, and please uh, make note of those things. We have our uh, Bible study tomorrow at noon. We have daily prayer times um, at, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Uh, the information is in your bulletin. If you're watching from online and you don't have a bulletin, you can go to our church website and find the information in the links there. Um, do want to make you know that because uh, the way we're structuring our Presbyterian women's circles uh, this year, um, combining uh, the circles into one gathering or one meeting at a time, um, instead of, uh, well, this time we will be having our meeting in the morning, so it will be at 10 a.m. on Tuesday. Uh, so please make note of that. Some folks can gather in the fellowship hall, uh, but then also uh, the teaching will um, be broadcast via Zoom as well. Note also that next week we have uh, called, the session has called a congregational meeting for the purpose of approving the pastoral terms of call as well as uh, nominating and electing uh, the three at-large members of our nominating ministry. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship God. Please join in our call to worship. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great, Great are, are the works, works of the Lord, Lord studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work and his righteousness endures forever. He has, he has gained renown by, by his wonderful deeds. deeds. The, the Lord, Lord is gracious and merciful. And merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He, he has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The, the fear, fear of the Lord is the, is the beginning, beginning of wisdom. wisdom. All, All those who practice it have good understanding. understanding. His praise endures forever. 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Let us worship God. Let us pray. Holy, Holy God, God, you, you confound, confound the world's wisdom by giving your kingdom to the lowly and pure in heart. Give us such a hunger and thirst for righteousness and perseverance in striving for peace that by our words and deeds the world may see the promise of your kingdom revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We know that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Confident in that knowledge, then, let us, uh, let us confess our sins, also in the assurance that God will meet our confession with his forgiveness. Let us pray. God of grace, you have given us Jesus, the light of the world, but we choose darkness and cling to things that hide the brightness of your love. Immersed in ourselves, we have not risen to new life. Baptize us with your spirit, that forgiven and renewed, we may preach your word to the nations and tell of your glory shining in the face of Jesus Christ our Lord and our light forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, hear and believe the good news that in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now as we come to the time in our worship in which we offer ourselves into the service of the Lord, we will... Uh, hear some beautiful music uh, offered to the glory of God by our choir. And I also urge you to look into your own hearts and see how you will offer yourself, uh, including in your giving of the tithes and offerings. For those of you in the sanctuary, you may give uh, uh, by depositing your gift in the offering plate um, in the narthex. And if you are watching online, you may send your gift to the church or you may give uh, online through the portal on our church website. But let us give ourselves to the glory of God.
Let us pray. Lord of all wisdom, knowledge, and truth, we seek you with all our heart. Do not let us stray from your commands. We have hidden your word in our heart that we might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach us your decrees. Through Christ our Lord, the word made flesh. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel according to Mark, beginning to read in the 21st verse of the first chapter. Hear now the word of God. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed. And they kept on asking one another, what is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. In the early days of the automobile, a man's Model T Ford was stalled in the middle of the road. And he couldn't get it to start, no matter how hard he cranked, nor how much he tried to advance the spark or adjust things under the hood. And just as he was about to give up, a chauffeured limousine uh, pulled up behind him. And a wiry, energetic man stepped out from the back seat and offered his assistance. And after tinkering, Uh, Under the hood, for just a moment or two, the stranger said, Now try it. And immediately the engine came to life. The well-dressed stranger then introduced himself. He said, My name is Henry Ford, and I designed and built these cars, so I know what to do when something goes wrong. In the world of automobile manufacturing, Henry Ford was considered one of the foremost authorities, if not the foremost. And he was considered so in large part because of his vast knowledge of the subject. Authority is one of those great intangible characteristics that we assign to certain people. Sometimes people are considered authorities based on their knowledge and their expertise. Others have authority that is recognized because of their position. And the notion of authority serves kind of as bookends to this morning's lesson from the Gospel according to Mark. Twice in this text, Mark tells us that the people are astonished, amazed at Jesus. And twice in this text, Mark tells us that it is the authority of Jesus that elicits this response of amazement from the crowd around him. The authority of Jesus, what is it about Jesus' authority? that sets him apart from other teachers or healers. In terms of this morning's text, I want to ask three questions in regard to the authority of of Jesus Christ. The first question is, what is so unique about Jesus' authority that you don't find in anyone else? Jesus' authority is different from the authority of the scribes, says Mark. The scribes were the teachers of the Old Testament law and the traditions, and they were well studied in the teachings, and they could recite obscure biblical texts without any kind of problem at all. Their authority came from their expertise. The authority of Jesus, says Mark, was altogether different, not like that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Whereas the scribes were the scriptural experts and could quote the Old Testament law in their sleep, the teaching of Jesus was unlike any that the crowd had ever heard before. He wasn't merely quoting the word of God. 
It was as if God himself were speaking through Jesus. And that's what was so different about the authority of Jesus. He was so holy other, so holy, so divine in his teaching. The difference between the authority of the scribes and the authority of Jesus is the same as the difference between hearing somebody quote an original source and then hearing the original source in person. The scribes were quoting the word of God. Jesus was speaking the very words of God. And that's what is so amazing about the authority of Jesus. Jesus is for us the voice of God. He's the word made flesh. There's no distinction between the voice of Jesus and the voice of God. There's no distinction between the teaching and the exhortation of Jesus and the teaching and the exhortation of God. There's no difference between the authority of Jesus and the authority of God because the two are one. They are indistinguishable. What is it that makes Jesus, that makes his authority unique? It's because his authority carries the weight of God behind it. And the second question really is just an extension of the first. What does the authority of Jesus look like? That is, how does he exercise his authority? And the answer to that question has to come from a broader reading of all the Gospels, including just the Gospel of Mark, but, but all the Gospels. Only when we see Jesus' ministry in its entirety will we really understand who he is and what it means that Jesus is the Son of God and the Lord of all creation. When you look at the Gospels in their entirety, what you find is that the authority of Jesus really is manifest in his lordship over every area of life. He has authority over evil, whereby he offers us security and peace and conquers evil for the salvation, for our salvation from sin. He has authority over the mind, whereby he reveals to us God's word and God's will and shows us the better way. He has authority over sickness, whereby we gain healing and wholeness that are beyond just the removal of a virus or the closing of a wound. He has authority over creation itself, whereby we gain confidence that neither storms nor earthquakes nor tornadoes or wildfires or any other natural disaster can thwart the will of God for our lives. And his authority takes the nature of a servant. Because in his own words, he says that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. His authority is informed by righteousness and compassion. He doesn't compel us to submit to him through power and might, at least not yet. Instead, he calls out to us invitingly. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. The third question that we must ask when confronted with the authority of Jesus is how are you going to respond? How will you respond when you encounter the authority of Jesus? Will you embrace and accept his authority by, by obeying him? Or will you cry out, as did the evil spirit in the, man's less, in the man in this morning's lesson, what do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? There's a classic devotional booklet called My Heart, Christ's Home. And in it, Robert Boyd Munger reminds us that the Christian life is a process of finding new areas of our heart where we need to submit to the authority of Jesus. We start out by inviting Jesus into our hearts, into our lives, to, to live in our heart, right? But we don't really fully every, understand everything that it entails at first. Then we invite Jesus on a tour of, of all the rooms in the house that is our heart, only to realize that those rooms all need cleaning. We invite Jesus into the study, which represents the mind, 
And when we bring him in there, suddenly we are aware of all these magazines and, and literature and TV shows and internet websites that pollute our mind. How can Jesus dwell in that kind of environment? We take Jesus into our recreation room, which represents our social life. Jesus wants to tag along when we go out, but we don't want him to come with us. He can join us for church on Sunday, but we really don't want him to come to that party on Saturday, do we? Our dining room is where our appetites and desires reside, and we soon find out that Jesus needs to work on that room as well. And it just goes that way in this little devotional book. It goes that way through all the rooms of the house. As we give Jesus authority over each area of our heart, he then cleans it out and he makes it suitable for his presence. Closets, windows, every nook and cranny. And eventually you decide that he's not in your home as a guest anymore, but he's there as the owner and you hand over the deed to him. That's the way it is when we submit to the authority of Jesus. Little by little, one day at a time, one area at a time, Jesus assumes control over our lives. Every day, we learn a little better what Paul means when he says, whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. The Bible points us to the day when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Bible is pointing us to that time when everybody will acknowledge his authority. The truth is, Jesus Christ already is Lord. But the question is, do we recognize him? Do we recognize that truth? Have you submitted to his authority? Or do you continue to fight against it? What do you do when you meet Jesus as one who has authority? Let us pray. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, we bow before you in humble praise and adoration, for you are our God and we are the sheep of your pasture. You are our good shepherd, always with us, leading us, nurturing us, feeding us, protecting us, caring for all our needs. Therefore, we turn to you with intercessions and petitions, for we know that you care and that you have the power and authority by which to act upon your care and your compassion. Hear us, O God, as we pray to you today. We are weary of the pandemic, O God. The restrictions and the precautions have worn on us for nearly a year. As people who long to be together, it's exhausting and frustrating to maintain our distance from one another. And yet we know that we must do what is necessary in order to protect one another, especially to protect the vulnerable ones. And so give us strength and encouragement as we continue during this extended season. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the countless frontline workers who are risking their own health in order to tend to the sick. For their lives manifest the words of Jesus when he said, Greater love has no one than this, that they are willing to lay down their lives for others. We thank you for the development of medical advances that are having effect against the coronavirus, especially vaccines and treatments. And we pray for you to guide our leadership at all levels to enable them to get the necessary medications everywhere they are needed, in our communities, our hospitals, throughout our nation and the world. And in the midst of the COVID pandemic, others are still suffering from a vast range of sicknesses and conditions. And so we pray for their healing as well. Merciful and compassionate God, we pray for you to comfort those who mourn. Calm the spirit of those who are anxious. Bring hope to those who despair. And heal every evidence of brokenness in the human condition. It is a tall order, we know, but we also know that you are up to it, for you are Lord over all. Guide us, we pray, through each day. Fill our hearts with the determination to serve you and glorify you. Show us how we can be instruments of your justice and righteousness in our daily lives. Use us, we pray, to offer relief for the poor, the hungry, the oppressed, and use us as instruments of your healing love and mercy. 
We thank you, O oh God, that you do not leave us alone. Indeed, you are with us always. Help us to be strengthened in that knowledge. And as we hear you calling to us, help us to respond with obedience and faithfulness. These and all our prayers we offer in the saving name of the one in whom you have placed all authority, Jesus Christ our Lord. And we pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. At this time, we will uh, suspend our in-sanctuary portion of our worship, and we'll uh, make our way over to the Fellowship Hall for the singing of our hymns and the saying of the Apostles' Creed. Um, uh, if you are watching us online, we will stop our uh, live stream for a moment and resume it again uh, when we gather in the Fellowship Hall. <laughs> 